The Allies were at last invading Europe, and Hitler was prepared. With America's entry into the war and the German losses in North Africa, Hitler knew an attempt on mainland Europe was inevitable. The attack would no doubt come across the Mediterranean, given the sizable Allied presence in North Africa and the desperate fight by the British to keep the Mediterranean open to Allied shipping. Now, thanks to the intelligence coup of the century, Hitler knew exactly where the attack was coming, and he was ready to crush the invasion force. A decisive victory on the beachheads would throw the Allied force back out to the sea, and the Americans, always late to a world war, had little talent and even less taste for war. Faced with such a massive defeat and loss of life, surely America would sue for peace and convince Britain to at last come to the negotiation table. Entire divisions of German infantry and armor were quickly and secretly moved out of Italy and rushed to Sardinia and Greece. The plan was sensible. Pushing past the Italian Alps would be suicide for the Allies. Greece offered a slightly more attractive route to Europe's soft underbelly. Hitler's vast network of spies and informants tell him that an invasion force is indeed massing in North Africa. The clock is ticking and Hitler is ready. There's just one problem. All of his troops are in the wrong place. Months earlier, a corpse of a British major washed up on a Spanish beach. Handcuffed to the corpse was a briefcase containing top-secret intelligence documents outlining the Allied plan to push into Greece and Sardinia and establish a foothold in Europe. Personal letters, photos, even theater tickets found on the body all convinced the German spies who took over the documents from the Spanish that the plans were authentic. Unfortunately for Hitler, it was all a ruse by British intelligence, who had dressed up the corpse of a homeless man in a major's uniform, invented an entire persona, and then pushed his body toward the Spanish coast out of a submarine, with the planted invasion plans handcuffed to his wrist. The Allies had originally considered pushing into southern France from Africa, but keeping Mediterranean sea lanes open would require silencing Italy, and the strategically important Suez Canal could never be kept secure as long as Italy was on the Axis side. Italy's own performance in the war so far further convinced the Allies that the best way to open a second front in Europe was to strike at Mussolini. To date, most Italian troops had terribly underperformed in combat. The easy victory that would make the Mediterranean an Italian lake, as Mussolini had promised, never came. Instead, the country was stuck in a quagmire of war, and popular support was rapidly diminishing. The first thrust of the attack on Italy would be to seize the large island of Sicily. This would provide Allied forces with the perfect launch pad for an offensive onto the mainland, as well as give Allied fighters and bombers several runways from which to operate and strike deep into Italy. If Sicily fell, it would also at last secure the Mediterranean to Allied shipping, which had been suffering greatly from Axis air attacks and submarine raids. The Americans, however, weren't quite so on board with an attack on Italy, and in truth it was the British and their sprawling overseas empire which would gain the most by knocking Italy out of the war. In exchange for their support in the attack, America forced Britain into accepting a much more expedient invasion across the Channel and into France at a later time. With Hitler's main forces diverted out of Italy, the attack to take Sicily at last begins on July 7, 1943, yet almost as soon as it starts, the attack is on the verge of failure as a freak storm falls on the massive invasion force. Smaller ships are battered and tossed about by the waves and forced to fall back, while in the skies above the fleet, German fighters descend to strafe the large troop transports. Thanks to the British deception, there's not enough German fighters to cause serious damage, but the attack takes a major toll on morale. The ongoing storm also seems a bad omen to men waiting to fight and die on Sicily's beaches. The fleet recovers and reassembles, but the element of surprise is long lost. Now Hitler knows that the Allied push is not coming to Greece. Sadly for him, it'll take weeks to move tens of thousands of troops back to Italy. On July 9th, the eve of the invasion, British and American paratroopers begin their assault in German rear areas. Bad weather continues to plague the invasion, though, and Allied pilots end up dropping their troopers well outside the planned assault areas. Many paratroopers jump too early and end up coming down in the sea, where laden by heavy equipment most drown. The paratrooper assault fails in its objective of creating a buffer between the invasion force and the beachheads, but American paratroopers widely scattered across the southern half of the island reform themselves into small groups and begin an extremely successful guerrilla campaign against the Germans. The Americans, acting in platoons or smaller-sized units, manage to cut key German communication lines and pin down German patrols. The confusion caused by the American paratroopers is only exacerbated when German communications go down. Around 250,000 combined Italian and German troops are holding the island, 
but the Italians are at this point more of a liability than an asset for the Germans. The troops are poorly equipped and have low morale, and to make matters worse, the Italian and German commanders can't agree on how to defend the island, causing the forces to become split. The Allies manage to regain some of the element of surprise by forcing landings in areas believed to be too shallow for the cargo craft bringing in heavy equipment, and suddenly American and British tanks are popping up in places they definitely should not be. For the British landing at Syracuse, the entire operation is practically a walk on the beach as they meet little to no resistance. For the Americans, though, it's a different story. Masses of Italian infantry and tanks push straight into the center of the U.S. beachhead, stalling the thrust into the island and threatening to push the entire American force back out to sea. To make matters worse, weather once more has played havoc, and massive congestion on the beaches leads to many U.S. tanks being unable to make it to the front lines. Instead, the Americans rely on overwhelming naval firepower and artillery to push back the Italian assault. But just as the Italians are defeated, fresh and experienced German troops crash into the exhausted American defenders. The U.S. is still at this point a great manufacturing power, but a relatively unimpressive military one. And the old European guards still believe Europe has the fittest fighting men on the planet, and the Americans are thought to have little skill or stomach for war. Crushing the American beachhead would prove far easier than dislodging the stubborn British. America's reputation is not completely undeserved, its troops having performed adequately but not exemplary at the battlefields of Africa. British faith in the Americans is so low that the American forces meant to initially support the British offensive, which is a polite way of saying that the British expect Americans to soak up German bullets while they establish themselves on the island and begin a proper fight. British hopes are certainly coming true, as their forces continue relatively unmolested. Meanwhile, on the second day of the invasion, America truly does seem to be on the verge of defeat, as Nazi tanks make it to within 2,000 yards of the beach. Yet stubborn American resistance forces the German back at an incredibly high cost. U.S. tanks are just now making it into the fighting. The feared Nazi panzers have been beaten back by infantry and artillery. Breaking out of the beachhead, U.S. troops push into the island itself, meeting surprisingly little resistance. Entire Italian formations surrender without putting up a fight, the men exhausted from years of war, demoralized by the defeat in Africa, and generally sick of supporting the German war. The number of POWs is so great that it threatens to stall out the entire advance. For the British, it's now their turn to meet the teeth of fierce German resistance. Elite German paratroopers are flown in from France and dig into the hills outside of the coastal plain. The British pry the Germans out of defensive positions after defensive position at a high cost, but eventually the Germans are forced to retreat. Now the Allies face a different problem altogether. While they've been expecting fierce resistance from the Italians defending their own soil, instead the Italians are surrendering in mass. On its push to capture the island's capital, the U.S. manages to capture 53,000 Italians at a cost of only 272 deaths. With the fall of Palermo, the Allies now control the western half of the island, and the race is on to destroy the Germans before they can reach ports on the northeast side of the island and retreat across the sea to the mainland. Then, on July 25th, Italian dictator Benito Mussolini is thrown out of office, a move that stuns Allied leadership. However, his deposement does not mean an end to Italy's involvement in the war just yet, and the fiercest fighting of the campaign takes place in the last days of summer. In a bid to cut the Germans off from their avenues of retreat, American infantry makes an amphibious landing behind German lines on the night of August 7th. The attack is a total surprise, yet the Germans are already in full retreat. Columns of troops are rushing past the Americans as they're making their landing, and while the assault fails to cut off the German retreat, the Americans still capture many. The campaign has now become a race to cross the mountainous terrain of northeast Sicily and destroy the German embarkation points. Sadly, the Allies are too late, and American forces enter the city of Messina just hours after the last German soldier boarded a ship to Italy. 100,000 veteran Axis troops successfully evade capture and will be waiting for the Allied assault on Italy itself, making the coming invasion even more difficult than it would have been. But Operation Husky is a complete success, and the Allies have at last a toehold from which to throw Italy out of the Second World War and open a second front in Europe. Now go check out World War I versus World War II, how do they compare? Or click this other video instead.